Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's so nice to see you once again. Uh, hope you all had a nice week. Um, I'll say, I guess, good afternoon, good evening, because um, Celine, uh, for your information, we have 27 participants this year in the y YCAP program, and um, they come from uh, all across the US, from uh, Washington State, California to um, Illinois, Missouri, um, you name it, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, DC, Florida, Virginia, Maryland. So we're very lucky to have this young energy. Um, they're all high school students ranging from, um, from I guess, um, nine to 12th uh, grades. And they, they have been very, um, uh, very motivated throughout the program uh, and uh, Jane, thank you so much for reaching out to uh, Celine Nielsen for us. So uh, dear Young Cultural Ambassadors, we have a very special guest today. We have Dr. Celine Yildiz Nielsen, co-founder and president of Globally Connected. Uh, so Dr. Nielsen, basically spent her entire career on migration related issues. She worked um, in different capacities in the last 20 years as director, professor, coordinator, manager, instructor, and consultant in this field. Uh, she um, has taught undergraduate and postgraduate courses in California, Iowa, and Washington DC, New York, and in Turkey on the subjects of migrant well-being and education. Um, as uh, you know, she uh, has her own uh, nonprofit organization dedicating to facilitating migrant and refugee integration. So today uh, she's going to talk to us about her organization, about the very critical topic of uh, migration and, uh, and refugees uh, that are at a all-time high, the numbers whose numbers are at the all-time high around the world. Uh, so it's uh, a significant uh, imminent crisis. And uh, she will also talk to us about the sustainable development goals and how her nonprofit, nonprofit and her work relates to the SDGs. So with that, uh, I am delighted to turn it over to Dr. Nielsen for her presentation. So uh, we'll have a maybe 15, 20 minutes presentation and then we'll open it for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Demet uh, for the introduction. I'm really glad to meet you all. It's very exciting for me to meet all of these young minds and uh, that have, you know, similar background as me uh, or, uh, or my children. So um, uh, thank you all for being here. I will uh, tell you a little bit about me. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to give you a presentation. I prepared a PowerPoint with some visuals um, to make it um, uh, easy for you to see some of the points that I'm going to make. And also um, after the presentation, I will, um, I have a little, you know, Kahoot game for you about the um, refugees. Uh, and then um, uh, that will take maybe five, six minutes, and then and then you can ask me questions. I think I'm going to continue like that if if that's okay with you, Demetan. Perfect. Sounds wonderful. Okay, so um, I will share my presentation right now. So I will talk to you about locally connected. That's the name of my. Um, uh, organization. It's um, uh, but before I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. So um, from um, I immigrated into United States when I was 18. I finished high school in Turkey and uh, I came with my family and um, I I went to school in California uh, to uh, University of California Berkeley and I got educated in actually French language. And I was always interested in international populations and international affairs. And, um, uh, and I knew that I wanted to work in that. My parents uh, were recruiting students from Turkey to University of California campuses, and I was interested in that. 
So um, uh, fast forward, I, uh, I moved to Iowa in, uh, with my family and, and I started working with refugees there because Iowa is a refugee resettlement state. And then from there, I wanted to, I have, uh, I've, after finishing my PhD, I wanted to use all my knowledge um, for a little bit in Turkey. I had some friends that had spent a year in Turkey teaching at universities. I, I wanted to share my knowledge. So I went to Gaziantep. And, uh, but at that time, the Syrian crisis had just started. And um, so there were a lot of um, uh, things people didn't know about refugees and what was going on. I had the knowledge from Iowa because I worked with refugees in Iowa. And, um, and I started going to the refugee camps and, and uh, started meeting uh, the, the population and, um, and uh, doing some projects like trauma management, educational projects and things. And then after I came back to United States, I really realized that this was a passion of mine. I, I mean, education is my background and um, working with refugees taught me a lot about myself, actually. I realized how similar I was to this population. And, um, and then I just um, uh, uh, was thinking of some ways to, um, to do something, basically. So I did, needed to do some research. I found out in, in, uh, in United States there were, I mean, in California there were refugees. And then um, and, uh, trying to look into the gaps, what was missing, you know, like education, English language, language was the most important part. And, um, and we started some classes, so we started like that. So I want to a little bit teach you about the world of refugees. And if you have a, you know, apart from your computers, what you're on, um, please take out your uh, gadgets and then type refugees or asylum seekers or um, uh, anything like that on your uh, um, images of your, of your browser. Just do this right now. And I don't know if they can um, participate in, in the conversation, but um, um, just maybe just shout out what, describe me what you see. What is the first thing that you notice when you put it in images, this picture? What do you notice? What, how can you describe this picture that you see? A lot of people in lines. A lot of people in lines. Uh, how would you describe the people? I mean, they're all not doing very well, clearly. It's always some sort of disaster in the background. It looks like a disaster and, and, and people don't look happy. Okay. And um, so these are some of the images that we see when we say, you know, like refugee, migrant, and, and uh, immigrant, asylum seeker. I have tried it with all. You put it in Google Images and these images pop up. And, um, and what we see there is usually it's not a mirror image of ourselves, right? It is something that is uh, uh, not similar to us. That's the first thing we uh, we see. So the world perception, you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit about perceptions and reality. The world perception at the moment is something like this. You see like hordes of people coming in. It's very overwhelming, very sad, and, and it's, it's, um, uh, it, it's not something really pleasant or, or we can't identify with these pictures, right? It's not something that is in our daily lives. Also, there's a world perception that, you know, like assumptions who might be hiding among them is terrorists and terrorism groups. Uh, in fact, uh, being a refugee is so difficult, uh, getting the vetting and going in, uh, having the status of a refugee is not something as simple. And um, in the United States, for example, there has not been any case of re refugee, uh, of uh, terrorists coming in as refugees. So these are some of the misperceptions we see. So reality check is that a refugee is whatever you Google, it's actually not a different species. It's a human being, and we have a lot more in common uh, with a refugee than, than anyone else. The only thing is that refugees are people just like you and me, just like, you know, could be high school students, could be anywhere, um, that left their homes without, um, uh, uh, without their uh, will. So um, what it is, is that they left their countries um, not by choice. So most of these uh, 
showed similar images, but in reality, meanings are a little bit different. For example, migrant is a name uh, that we give a person that moved from one place to another permanently. So it's an umbrella term that could include refugees and immigrants and, and, and whoever. Immigrant is a person from who moves from one country to another by choice. My parents were immigrants, for example. We chose to live in the United States for various reasons. You know, there could be some effects that um, that you don't have in your home country or a better uh, situation, in, uh, better opportunities in the host country, whatever the reason, it's by choice. Asylum seeker, on the other hand, is that you seek international protection but um, refugee status is not determined because refugee status is given uh, uh, to an individual um, who is proved to be uh, running away or from um, forced to flee their homes because of persecution, war, or violence. So I, I want to make this clear for you because um, there are some asylum seekers in the United States that came from the Southern border. So seeking asylum is not illegal. Seeking asylum, no matter how you come into the country, is, um, is not an illegal thing. So you can come into the country as a tourist or, a, or as a student or uh, cross the border with, without documentation. It is not illegal to seek asylum. Your asylum has to be heard and the government can decide if your case holds water uh, or, and w once it does, you uh, have the uh, refugee status. So um, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about the, uh, the um, refugee status is some given to someone who has the fear of persecution or violence because of their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership to a social group. These are the reasons uh, people can actually uh, become refugees in other countries. So let me tell you very quickly about the 1951 convention and 1967 protocol. These are important points because it has something to do with how Turkey takes a stance too. So in 1951 convention, uh, they thought that, oh, after the second world war, there are a lot of refugees in Europe and, but this is a temporary situation. So let's, let's have a branch of the United Nations and then uh, uh, that, that will deal with refugees. And they thought that it was something temporary, but it's not because there are many, many more refugees. So uh, it was established um, and with a limitation that uh, was, you know, like due to the effects that has happened before 1951, referring to the war and in within Europe. So it had a geographical. In 1967, they thought uh, that the the, there was a lot more happening in the world and there were a lot more things, um, especially you know, in Southeast Asia, there were a lot more refugees. So they, they, they took away these um, temporal and geographical limitations and, um, and they, um, uh, so it encompassed more people around the world. So refugee response in Turkey has a lot to do with these conventions. Does anybody know why? Why? Um, does Turkey have something to do with the uh, 1951 convention or 1967 protocol? So um, it's not something, it's not common knowledge, so I'm not surprised. But the, the thing is that um, Turkey signed the 1951 convention. So Turkey is a refugee receiving country and received a lot of refugees from Europe uh, after the Second World War. But um, Turkey did not um, participate in the 1967 protocol. So what happened was that um, the geographical limitations were not lifted uh, when it comes to Turkey. So when the Syrian refugees come from Turkey, they weren't really protected under the United Nations refugee protocol in Turkey because Turkey had their own rules and, and regulations when it comes to the guests. Uh, um, they, they called them the guests in Turkey and um, have developed their own way of dealing with these uh, people who were coming from Syria. So that's one of the reasons that people uh, wanted to cross the ocean to get to uh, Europe because once you get to Europe, Greece was one of the signatories. In Greece, um, Syrian people uh, could sign up as refugees 
and be under the protection of uh, UNHCR. The difference is that once you're under the protection of UNHCR, then you could uh, be resettled into a third country. It could be United States, it could be you know, Australia or, or any other. So you would have the right that. Um, once they're in Turkey, they wouldn't have this right to be resettled into a third. So there was all these uh, things that happened. And what happened was in, 19, in 2000, responded to this picture of a little toddler uh, being washed ashore. And it really hit the world by heart. And the refugee situation um, was again in the uh, radar of all these uh, of all these countries. So people flee. This is a picture from nine, uh, from the First World War. Um, people were fleeing, and these are. This is a picture after the Second World War. Refugees. These are all pictures of refugees. What is striking, you will see, is that. The, the colored picture next to it is from this year. And uh, again, from 2019, 2020, um, there isn't much difference um, what happened in terms of refugees. So this is a, this is a very uh, shameful situation as far as the world is concerned. So I want to quickly introduce you some of the people that I know are uh, refugees. And Ms. Selka uh, fleed Bosnia. There was this war in 1993, and then uh, she fleed Bosnia, and she says the bloodshed was unbearable, neighbors became enemies, people were slaughtering each other, and I felt lucky how, uh, to get out alive. This was a musician that came from Syria, just walked over when his uh, shop was bombed, and um, so he took his instrument and he crossed the border to get to Turkey without knowing if he's going to go back ever or is he going to stay there and things like that. So um, there were, uh, Ravdanur is actually, uh, she's an activist, she's very famous, you can Google her. And I met her in a refugee camp and she lived in Idlib and she said, we lived near a river in a very green land. First, my classmate was killed in front of us she was a high school student, just like you guys. Um, she was just texting her friends and wondering what, what she would wear the next day. And then my dad got scared and we ran to Turkey. They actually went uh, like 30 miles on foot. Um, I liked my house and my town. I didn't want to go to Turkey. And I'm from a very small country, but now the world is not big enough for us. And she said, she wasn't, I was not born a refugee and the war in my country is not my fault. So one of those things that we can see is that um, these people are not that different than us. It's just that uh, the circumstances in, in their countries made them uh, targets. This is an Afghan refugee we work with. My father wanted to send me to school, but afraid for my safety. A lot of Afghan women, because of the Taliban, can't go to school. So they, they were sent to Pakistan to get uh, their education. I'm going to put these, you know, like in the chat box afterwards, because these are really good um, videos, short videos to explain the situation. So I want you guys to look at it. This is a, um, a BBC turned the Syrian journey into a game. I, I don't really agree with it, but it does give the notion of, you know, like choices and the limited choices. It's like whatever choice you take, you know, by land or by uh, sea, you have a, a chance of being killed. So it's almost like a video game. They turned it into it, the refugee experience. So Globally Connected, I formed Globally Connected um, with the hopes that we would just, um, uh, we would work with refugees and, and meet the needs of the refugees. Most, one of the uh, biggest uh, things is that uh, refugees uh, face is just like an immigrant, language is a big uh, obstacle. So we, uh, we started um, our classes. So our vision is actually an interconnected dialogue to promote the refugee rights and, um, and see that refugees are integrated into their new communities. So it's to, um, what do we do? We educate. Education is the, at the core of locally connected. So um, we seek to improve educational opportunities. We have ESL classes, public health workshops, mental health workshops, because one of the most important mental health problem refugees face is trauma and employment workshops and conversation partners and, and uh, online tutoring. If any one of you 
want to uh, be a part of it, please, um, you can email me afterwards. So this is one of the uh, sustainable development goals, quality education. And um, our organization tries to meet this gap. What else do we do? We foster economic independence. And how do we do that? We, um, we promote entrepreneurship of the woman. Uh, we do, you know, like employment workshops and, um, and we are trying to get the, uh, uh, our community involved in their economic uh, independence. Why? Because um, if, their economic, if the people who are vulnerable, their economic uh, independence is, is solved, then the whole community gains. Um, and this is also one of the um, sustainable development goals. It's no poverty. So by equipping vulnerable populations with important skills, then uh, we reduce poverty by making them more self-reliant. Um, and this also ties with the sustainable development goal of decent work and economic growth. We promote inclusive and pro uh, employment uh, with the employment help, then uh, we again, help the economic growth of our communities. And what else we do is that we empower. Empower is actually a very tricky word because it, it denotes that you don't have the power, but it actually, it's uh, reaching within that you already have. So um, a lot of these women that we work with have are very powerful, but they're not really aware of what they can do, or maybe don't have the opportunities or the tools to bring about the power that they have in. So um, uh, what they did was, you know, like they helped the community, even though they're vulnerable populations, by cooking, by making blankets, they help the communities. They are a, a source that help others as well. And also um, with the empowerment comes the sustainable development goal of gender equality. And we have several scholarships for girls and uh, for, uh, and, and for female rights, empowering females with uh, empower, uh, vulnerable populations. This is one of our goals actually, because um, as one of our Afghan women said, if you uh, educate a man, you educate a person. If you educate a woman, you educate a village. So it's very important to pass this down. Um, also, uh, the sustainable development goal number 10, reduced inequalities is very important on our uh, radar uh, by improving the access to education and employment and also advocacy, we are able to provide a platform to address and reduce perceptions that create inequalities. For example, we work with a lot of organizations that are um, uh, for refugees that uh, have been targeted and, and uh, persecuted because of their um, uh, choices and sexual sexuality. So um, another thing we promote is peace and justice. For years, we have been doing a peace walk in International Day of Peace, which is uh, September 21st. And, um, and we do these peace walks, peace events. This year was the only year we didn't do this gathering, but we did a Zoom event um, and, um, and educated the community about uh, what it means to be peace, what it, uh, how can we get to know our communities. So it starts small, that's what we say. And, um, and this ties well with the sustainable development goal, peace, justice, and strong institutions. I have spoken at the United Nations twice and uh, on behalf of refugees and on behalf of the locally connected. And, um, and uh, how, uh, how do we, hold ourselves accountable is that we not only advocate for the refugee rights, but we do something about it. Um, like, you know, providing uh, scholarships and things like that and supporting girls' education. These are some of the um, projects we have and um, we collaborate with a lot of institutions with the projects. Uh, right now we're working with the makeshift camps in near Izmir uh, for the uh, for the refugees, uh, they live in really really deplorable conditions, and none of the kids in those camps are going to school. So we are trying to change that. So if you are really depressed about this presentation, don't worry because there is hope, and the hope is, drum roll please, it's you, because young minds like you 
is uh, making a change in the world because by being aware, we can change laws, we can change regulations, we can change the, the people's attitudes and perceptions. For example, these are people like you in Dublin and this is in Berlin. Even though you hear all these horrible things that is happening and people are uh, uh, shunning refugees and migrants, this is also happening at the same time. Grassroots organizations and communities are getting together to welcome them. And this is Izmir, Turkey, even though there's a, a strong opposition to Syrians as well. This is also what's happening in Sydney. And this is Riverside, California, my hometown in California right now, and, and um, uh, from some of our talks. So I will leave you with a few, um, let's see how many, okay, with a few uh, advice. And um, so pay attention to your surrounding and what goes on in your community. Who is in your community? and what is happening, pay attention to that. And history shows that most lasting change happens from the bottom up. So what you do in your communities, even so little matters. You know, you, you may be uh, tutor a, a person uh, that, is, that does not have any um, way of learning, let's say math, and that matters. So don't listen to anyone who's discouraging you from doing the things because it's impossible. People told me you can't go into the refugee camps. You can't do this by yourself. You know, why, why would you even deal with refugees anyway? Why does it matter? But don't listen to people who are um, talking negatively about your passions and what you want to do. Because what we want to do contribute into the world, it comes from uh, our passions. And if you have obstacles that seems too difficult to overcome, so talk to a five-year-old because they always know what to do and, and life is easy. Children take life as it comes and, um, and don't see obstacles. And uh, don't lose sight of why you're doing what you're doing. And when you get into the prestigious offices, for example, if you become the MD you wanted to be, if you become the state legislator or the president or anything like that, and several titles after your name, remember why you started in the first place. Make friends not acquaintances, not people who will benefit uh, you when you, through your network, but friends that you care and that care about you. So, um, and you will find wherever you go that it is the people that make a place work worthwhile. Um, thank you so much. And this is, you know, like my social media and, and I can, you know, share uh, this presentation with um, Cenk or whoever wants to, if you want to take a look at it, if you want to take a look at all those links that I sent, um, you can do that. And we also have a shop, we, we sell refugee made, you know, like cookbooks and poetry books. And, and I wrote a book about my experience in, in Turkey. Um, you can find that there too. Um, so right now, I'm going to stop the share. And I hope it was, uh, it was a lightning fast presentation. I know that it was a lot to take in, but I hope it, it was helpful. So right now, without wasting any time, if you are ready, and if you have ever played uh, Kahoot, this is uh, what it looks like. Let me just bring it up. So. Thank you so much. By the way, Selin, this was wonderful, very inspiring and informational at the same time. Thank you so much. It's 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 a lot to um to, to take absorb, in, yeah. but mm -hmm. so you will see if you um go to kahoot.it, you will see mm -hmm. this um uh, window. And what you're going to do is that uh, I'm going to share with you now the game pin. And you are going to put that pin into your uh, uh, wherever that blank space is, and then choose a nickname for yourself or your own name. And uh, let's play this game. Let's see. And so I never the, played uh, it before, so I'm excited. Yes. I wonder if okay. others played it. Yeah, everybody can play. Has anyone else played it? I don't this? know if you played it, but yeah, kahoot.it. And then you will see that screen. And this is, this is what you put in it. Uh, I'm gonna share with you right now.
and it has this very annoying music when it comes on. And I know the, 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 the students know. So this is the number you put in. And I'm going to see all the nicknames or names. And, and once everybody's in, we will start playing. that about it I think I think that's about it so if nobody else is joining I'm gonna start the game oh one more person I think that's it let's start Some of the information you might have to guess. All right, let's see, most people knew what it was. It's actually there are 70 million displaced people in the world, uh, both internally and, and out of their countries. And this number is increasing because of climate change, because of all the violence and, and things that are happening in the world. Um, and actually um, COVID-19 stopped countries to take in refugees, but it didn't stop these uh, conflicts. So um, conflicts still go on and um, uh, we just hope for a better future. Okay. All right, Pelin, way to go. I was hoping most people would know this. Yes, Turkey actually holds 4 million Syrian refugees and, and uh, Afghan and Iraqi refugees as well. So it's the country that holds by population the most number of refugees. And uh, I guess per capita, it could be Lebanon because every one in four person is, is a refugee there. Okay. Ooh, Mina is competitive. Okay, let's go. It's true or false. Ah, this was a tricky one. It was actually true in the last 10 years, especially in the last two years, there were more Christian refugees that were admitted than, than Muslim ones. In uh, the last 20 years, it was um, 79,000, I believe was the number. All right, every time it changes, this is very, very exciting. Okay, Noel, let's go. So this is, you have to, um, you have to place them. This is the ranking, highest to lowest.
Yes, the correct order is Texas. Actually, you wouldn't guess that, but Texas took the, in the most number of refugees, then Washington State, um, uh, New York, and then California. The, actually, these are the top four refugee re receiving states in the United States. All right. I think I talked about it. Let's see if you remember what I said. Awesome. Most of you remembered what I said. It is actually never illegal to cross a border to seek asylum. Um, it, it's um, seeking asylum is um, never illegal. Wow. Every time it's somebody else. Let's see. We have a couple more questions. Oh, you all knew this one. Yeah, PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. Most of the refugees, uh, the biggest problem is trauma. And um, because forcibly being removed from your home uh, traumatizes everyone. And um, that's one of the things. And we also uh, have programs to deal with that. Okay, brown hair is doing great. Let's see, two more questions. This is a guess. I actually it is um, false because it's fifty percent. I mean, half of all school age refugee children are out of school in the world. This is this is a horrific uh, statistics. It that means that. Um, it is a lost generation. 50% of all the refugees that are displaced are um, out of school. And that's uh, um, and it was before COVID. So right now that number is probably even higher. And that's a very, very alarming thing. Okay, Defne, way to go. One more question. Let's see who's gonna win. Actually, it is true, um, refugees, in, as absurd as it may seem, that um, when they are flown, uh, uh, they get the refugee status and they're flown from the countries they're at into United States, they have to pay back their, their, that airline money back to United States government. And they are given a certain time to do that. But um, uh, it is true. If it's, for example, a family of five, husband, wife, three kids, um, they have to pay back everybody's uh, plane ticket. So it's one of those weird things. OK, let's see. Third place, Dennis. <laughs> Django is in the second place. Let's see. Defne! <laughs> Bravo, Defne. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So let me. Wow, that was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So um, uh, thank you so much for participating. Now I'm open for your questions. Yes, you can post your questions uh, in the chat box or you can. Raise your yeah, I hand. I have bombarded you with all that. Um, I was wondering what your experience was like, like working at refugee camps, like in Turkey and stuff. Yeah, um, I I went to the refugee camp in 2012, and I want I was just curious. I wanted to find out, so I went to a government refugee camp, and I found a way to get in. And um, uh, you know, I knew somebody who knew somebody, 
and then it was very um it was pretty organized there you know there were schools of course not adequate but um the only thing was people were very traumatized because it was a border camp so um the other side was syria so we could even hear the bombing and and some of the people were going to fight and then coming back into the camp so it was a very traumatic uh experience for them and um uh, but um so uh, yeah it was it and and then um uh some of the things you know that was lacking was uh, basically you know like the, there wasn't in there wasn't that many opportunities for uh, educational, you know, like resources, basically. So lately, I was going to these makeshift camps, for example, they're not government camps, they are people who just got together, for example, working in, uh, in uh, agricultural fields, and they, they live together. Those are really horrific situations, they don't have running water, they have to pay for the place that they're actually occupying their landowners, and they pay uh to to be there uh it's not even tents it's like tarp thrown over sticks and um uh, there's mud and and uh, there's some sort of electricity they come from like nearby a uh, farm or anything like that and there were there are no um schools no toys nothing so those are really really difficult situation and uh and yeah those are uh, that I have seen, and this is in Izmir, near Torbalı. Um, these camps still exist. They are, uh, even though the government closes some of them, you know, like disperse the people into the cities, um, but um, they still exist and they, they move from place to place sometimes when they're dispersed because they're, they have no other place to live. Um, so yeah, I, I go from time to time. Um, we have established uh, some transportation from the camps to the nearby schools because Syrian kids have the right to go to school in Turkey, but um, you know transportation is a big deal. So uh, and then uh, once we established that, we realized that the, none of the kids had shoes basically to to go to school. So we had to do a drive to buy them shoes. So um, it might seem so far away and so simple that you know like something simple as shoes uh, that um, these people really, really didn't have. So that, that was a very difficult thing to see. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions in the chat box. Minajim, would you like oh, yeah. to read the questions we received? Um, sure. Um, so Dida asked, what made you continue visiting the camps and how did you know that you wanted to make a change? Um, my, my goal was not actually, you know, to make a change. The, the reason I wanted to initially be involved and wanted to see the camps was because um, uh, I worked with refugees before and, and I had listened to their stories and I was curious to see it firsthand what is going on. And um, but, uh, and then, so I wanted to find out, you know, my area's education, what is going on? What is, how are they being taught? What are they being taught? And things like that. But when I went in, I saw that one of the biggest problems was trauma. You know, like a lot of the kids were traumatized. A lot of the people evet. were traumatized. And that's and really in all the looking to the heart. heart. So, um, uh, so when, we came back, you know, to United States, and I met with some of my friends that have also worked with refugees, and we started brainstorming. We were just saying that, okay, you know, we have seen all these things, and then we have all this knowledge, you know, how can we use our knowledge, and how can we use what, what we can, um, maybe to, to do something for these people, and are there any people in our communities? So um, those are some of the things. And one other thing was that I'm a first generation immigrant. I think most of you are maybe second generation immigrants, like your parents came from Turkey. Um, I came to, into this country as an adult and, and I have had a lot of um, problems uh, with the culture shock. Culture shock meaning that, you know, like you come from a certain culture that uh, has values and traditions and which is not really known in the new culture that you have. And you feel this loss. 
And, and because I felt that, I knew that these people who were forcibly taken out of their countries were probably feeling this loss too. Um, and, um, and that probably was my driving factor. Okay. And then we had another question from Zainip and she asked, how can I get more people in my community to be more open-minded about refugees? Unfortunately, I live in a very small-minded town with ignorant people. I appreciate this question very much because it is, it, it is a million dollar question, right? You know, like we want to, um, so you become aware of something and then, and then you want to spread it, but then you live in a closed-minded community. I would say, um, I, I would say just start small, you know, like um, talk to your family, talk to your friends about what you know, or maybe if they come to you with, uh, with something about refugees, for example, a myth about refugees, maybe something like, oh, refugees are terrorists or refugees are um, uh, poor people trying to take advantage of us or something like that and hit them with, with knowledge, you know, like find out from uh, credible sources, you know, not magazine science or, or, or some fake news, but something that is actually empirical research that, um, uh, that shows the reality and, um, and, and source them, you know, like give them many sources. Well, if, and, and question them. Question people who are coming to you with uh, some myths, um, where do they get their information? And how do they know well, to trust that information? And you can just say that, well, uh, I know firsthand somebody who has worked with refugees that, that refugees are more like us than, than anybody else. So, you know, like small, start small. Um, I also had another question. Um, do you have any book recommendations that are related to like refugees or um, asylum seekers or of that topic? Um, uh, any what? I didn't hear the first part. Um, book, book recommendations. Book recommendations. Yes, there are many books about, you know, like refugees and, and, and um, uh, enforced migration. Um, for example, you can read my book. <laughs> I, I, wrote, I wrote a book about the um, Syrian refugees and my experiences and what um, uh, basically it's not, a, um, it's not like a textbook. It's like people's accounts of what happened. It's almost like an oral history. And there are many oral history books too. Um, so, um, you know, my book is called Encounters in Turkey, Syria, Borderland. But uh, also you can look into uh, like Malala's book. Um, the, uh, I don't know if you are, uh, do you know Malala who is the- Yeah, she I actually shot. read her book. Yeah, I read her book yes. on refugees. Yes, and uh, Malala's book, I would recommend. There are um, many books about, you know, like you probably uh, read a lot of books about the uh, refugee situation in the second world war in Europe, uh, but, um, uh, there, there is an Afghan, um, um, I, I, I can't, you know, like the, the name is, um, uh, escapes me now. Um, remember who wrote the, the Kite Runner? Uh, can anybody remember? Anybody? Yes, I mean, I know the author, but. Yeah, and um, so um, that's also a, a good book. Um, I will. I will actually, um, that's, um, yeah. Khalid that's, Husseini. Yeah, Khalid Husseini is uh, uh, another author. Um, that, um, Washington Shire is a British poet that wrote about it. And um, uh, Narwan Hashimi is an uh, Afghan uh, writer. And she writes a lot about uh, her accounts. So these are like first-hand accounts of refugees talking about their experiences. And those would be really, really good um, resources for you to see. And they're all talking about, um, you know, like this century, what's, what's going on now. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Dr. Nielsen, I have a uh, question. I mean, maybe a couple of questions, but um, I uh, have read that when somebody becomes a refugee, they remain displaced in average from 10 to 26 years. And uh, when a refugee camp is set up, usually their average life, life is about 17 years. So basically, once you become a refugee, <laughs> you spend the rest of your life as a refugee, most likely, uh, which is a terrifying thing. I mean, uh, imagine like your life changes overnight and then that becomes your new, uh, your, your new life for the rest of your life, basically. Um, yeah, your new reality. That, exactly. That, that is new. true. That is true. It's um, um, and I saw this firsthand when I met the Syrian people who were coming into Gaziantep from Aleppo. Uh, I was talking to them, befriending them. We we shared a lot of things, and um, most of them did not expect uh, this situation to last so long. They were thinking that well, in a few months, uh, things will get better. We'll go back to our homes. Or, you know, like if we lost our homes, we'll go back to rebuild. You know, that was the notion. Um, I mean, it's, what is it? Uh, it in its 10th um, year, basically, uh, right now in, in the crisis, yeah. people don't exactly. have that much hope anymore. So, but uh, then it becomes a very, very painful realization of that, okay, I don't have a land anymore. I don't have anything to connect myself to anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but still, you know, it is very difficult to, mm -hmm. yeah, to accept. So then, I mean, if the refugee camp camps, once they're set up, if they're there for 17 years, they become like cities, basically. I mean, it's not just a camp anymore. Yeah, they that's why their, they, they close down as soon as possible. Right, so they should be closed down if, because if they stay, then people never integrate. So yeah, that was my question. I mean, what is the fastest way to integrate these people? That's uh, it, and that's also, it. yeah. That's one question. The second is, what do you think about, uh, I understand Turkey receives, of course, you know, millions of refugees and probably uh, they never signed. It's all, it has always been that way and they never signed the UN convention uh, on refugees. Maybe they don't want to have, I mean, maybe don't want to settle that many refugees, but I don't know, I'm just um, speculating. So if you can share the reasons, you, you think this is right or wrong or? Yes, yes, I, I, I will give you my opinion. So uh, first about integration, that's a very good point because when is it that we realize that refugees are not going back and then we have to integrate them into our communities and how do we integrate them into our communities? Um, so it takes two. Uh, integration is not a one-way street. So um, uh, people have to be uh, willing and open-minded to receive refugees and people will be willing and open-minded to uh, uh, integrate into their new communities. So this willingness sometimes is, is very difficult to establish because people are very uh, dearly connected to um, their cultures, their, their heritage, and, and they think any kind of uh, adaptation will take away from that. So that myth should be busted and, and people need to realize that we can, as we know, you know, like we can uh, connect to our own cultures uh, uh, as, you know, Turkish individuals, and we can also connect to our uh, host communities as Americans. So it is possible to, to have, to be bicultural, just like to be, uh, it's possible to be bilingual, but it takes, it takes deliberate education. It takes deliberate efforts to bring people together and, and um, uh, people to understand this fact and to be, you know, like to start with the motivation factor to be willing. And then of course, integration is um, as with anything, uh, it's not a one way street. It's almost like grief, right? When somebody dies, you ha have this enormous grief and then, and then it gets better and then it gets worse some days and it gets better. It's the same with integration. For example, you, you feel more connected to your host community some days and some days you feel rejected by some person or you, depending on your experience, you are stereotyped or bullied, then you feel closer to your uh, uh, original community. So these things will happen. 
um, the, the best thing we can do is that not um, judge people because of their background, um, not uh, judge people because of their situation of being in that country, and, and, and the people who are coming to, to be willing to make friends and, and, and connect with each other. So those are, I mean, it seems simple, but it is a lot more difficult than, than it is. The situation in Turkey is that um, the Turkey not signing the uh, 1967 protocol, I don't know the reasons for that, but it caused a lot of problems because, uh, because Turkey made the rules of how the refugees were going to uh, integrate into Turkish society instead of international uh, going along with international laws. So, and that created a lot of rumors that created a lot of myths. And for example, well, there was this uh, myth that um, they said, oh, all the Syrians can go to college in Turkey, but Turkish people can't go to college. So there were a few um, Syrians accepted into colleges that were already going to college in Syria and, and they had uh, these things. But then um, what became rumor was that, uh, that it was the norm. So uh, once this became, this rumor spread, and that's one of the most dangerous things, and people started having negative attitudes because they're saying that, well, why isn't my daughter can't go to college then, you know, like uh, some Syrian just came yesterday, uh, you know, can go to college. It is, uh, so these kinds of rhetorics, unfortunately, um, stopped the uh, integration process and uh, started people to you know turn their backs on each other instead of you know like embracing each other basically because uh, like I said in the beginning of my presentation we are not that different you know like we are all human beings wanting to be productive members of our community and what defines our community is up to us so um, that's, that's the thing that we need to start with when we are talking about refugees, people, host communities, and things like that. We are all, you know, like in the same boat, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I once uh, listened to Chobani CEO Hamdi Ulukaya, who is a big supporter mm -hmm. of refugees. Yes. He said, uh, you're a refugee until you have a job. So, uh, and he hired a lot of refugees in his uh, company. Yes, he's and one he of, said, no, I changed change their that. lives. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Exactly, exactly. Here, for example, uh, let me tell you about the US rule. Uh, United States, when a refugee arrives into United States, they have three months support. This is very, very little. Three months to, in order to find it, you know, learn English, find a job, uh, sign their kids up to school, uh, health screenings, uh, find an apartment to live, cars and all that stuff, driver's licenses, everything has to happen in three months. So, and then there are these resettlement agencies. So the, the agency's job is to get all these things happen in three months so that they're self-sufficient. So what happens is, for example, you have this engineer that comes from Afghanistan or some uh, machine specialist that come from Syria they don't care about that. What job is available? Okay, you know, like 7-Eleven clerk or um, security guard or something like that. Whatever is just quick, they get these jobs and their social capital is never, you know, like uh, valued. So those are those mismatches are, are really um, unfortunate because there, there could be a better use of people's skills, you know, like developed all these skills of all these years but, um, uh, and they don't get. So what happens is that, you know, like if they have a job that they're economically self-sufficient, then, um, then they feel that they contribute to their families and their communities. Well, very, uh, very difficult, but inspiring. Hey, we're out of talk, but um, um, thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, I think we are uh, yeah, running will, out of time. Yeah, I don't know. You can share um, my um, email or my, my website. I yes. can actually uh, put my website here. Then you can. Perfect. We did that. We shared my, it with uh, them already. But please go ahead. Um, and, and Jane kindly shared uh, the link to your book 
on Amazon. Thank you, thank you. And also I will share, okay, um, there are these two videos that I thought that was really helpful for especially this audience um, to find out a little bit more about it. One of them is a, is a YouTube little six minute a uh, cartoon video about uh, the Syrian situation explained in Europe. And the other one is the, um, the BBC game, like you choose and then you put yourself in, in the place of a, a mm -hmm. refugee. So these two links, you can just copy and, and get them. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was a wonderful discussion. We learned a lot. Um, thank you. I mean, thank you for having us informative, inspiring. Um, I mean, I feel like a different person. <laughs> and, Thank you so uh, much. And I appreciate all these students to, um, uh, to come and to hear me. And I'm just very excited to, to talk to you. Thank you. And Jake, do you want to say yeah, closing just, words? <laughs> no, Since, again, I, I like, um, this is, this may be my second time hearing it, like because you were at the Turkish house, but it's still just as inspiring. And I always learn just a little bit more um, each time, Selin Hanum. And uh, thank you again uh, uh, for doing this. I think, um, yeah, I hope I hope the um, kids got a lot out of it. I certainly always get a, a lot out of it. And um, again, thank you so much for your time. Just you know, taking your taking the time out of your day. Um, to you know, present to to uh, to all of us, and so yeah. I really, really appreciate it. Of course, the pleasure is mine. Thank you so much for thinking of me. Anytime. Thank you. And again, let's give a big round of applause to Dr. Nielsen. Thank you so much. So, yay. <laughs> so, thank you so much. I will see you guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. -bye. Bye.